We'll bring this meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. I want to welcome everyone who is in attendance this evening at our meeting and also everyone that's viewing the meeting on G10 television. To start out with tonight, uh, I'm going to ask some gentlemen that are with us tonight from local Boy Scout Troop 370 if they will come forward. Mr. Andre, Andreas and Adrian Sanchez and Hunter Carter. And they, if you will please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, these young men will lead us. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Carter, would you lead us in the invocation? Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks as always for the blessings you so graciously bestow upon us individually and upon us collectively as the city of Jacksonville. We pray that you would empower each of us who serve, that we may serve always the common good, that we would always put service above self, and that each day we would strive to make our city a better place for all of us to live and work in. We pray for our military who are serving us here and around the world, for their safety, and as always for their anxious families. As always, we ask again that you give guidance and direction to our mayor and to our council. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Good job. <clears throat> Members of council, we have, you have before you tonight the uh, agenda for this meeting along with the consent items and at this time I would entertain a motion to adopt but with the addition of a proclamation for safe kids uh, and we'll put it following uh, presentation D for the evening. Mayor, I move that we approve the agenda, uh, the agenda to include safe kids after D. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All opposed. Next, we have the approval of the minutes for the March 4th, 2014 special workshop meeting and also the March 4th, 2014 regular meeting. Mayor Phillips, I'll make the motion to approve the March 4th special workshop meeting and the March 4th regular meeting minutes. Thank you. Anybody want to second that? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Hear none. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? And the meeting uh, minutes have been approved. Next, I have uh, about six presentations tonight, and I'm going to come around up front here. Thank 
session tonight. I'd like to call my good friend Lou Hamburg. I see out here in the audience to come up here and join me. Good evening. How are you doing? It is with great pleasure uh, to be able to present this proclamation to you. This is a Relay for Life. This is an opportunity to unite as a community to honor cancer survivors, raise awareness about what we can do to reduce cancer risk, and raise money to help the American Cancer Society fight the disease. Today, with the support of thousands of volunteers, the American Cancer Society is helping save more than 400 lives a day. This year, the Relay for Life is in its 20th year in Onslow County, and it will be held again at Northside High School beginning on Friday, April 25th. Hopefully, it'll be a great night for that, and uh, hope we have as big a turnout as we normally do. We're bigger. So. I hope so. I'm going to read this proclamation. Whereas Relay for Life was founded in 1985 by Dr. Gordy Klatt, who walked and ran 81 miles in 24 hours around a track in Tacoma, Washington, raising over $27,000 in sponsored donations for the American Cancer Society. And whereas, Relay for Life is an overnight team event to raise funds to fight cancer. Members of each team take turns walking, running around the track, while a festive atmosphere is created with the entertainment and camping out. And whereas, the event begins with the cancer survivor's walk. During the survivor's lap, all cancer survivors at the event take the first lap around the track, celebrating the victory over cancer while being cheered, cheered on by other participants. And whereas, the luminaria ceremony takes place after dark, remembering those who have been lost to cancer, honoring those who have fought cancer in the past, and supporting those who will fight cancer as their life continues. And whereas money raised during Relay for Life supports the American Cancer Society's mission of saving lives and creating a world with less cancer and more birthdays by helping people stay well, by helping people get well, and by finding cures for cancer, and by fighting back. Now, therefore, I, Sammy Phillips, Mayor of the City of Jacksonville, do hereby proudly proclaim the month of April 2014 as Relay for Life Month in the city of Jacksonville. And I further encourage all residents to participate and help fight the war against cancer. And I know there's probably everybody in this room probably has had the experience of having a loved one, a friend or a loved one that has been a, has had this disease. And, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity for you to come out and support further research. And LaRue, it's with great pleasure, and I know that you, you know, you have a lot here riding on this. Right. Would you like to speak? And thank you so much. You're welcome. And thank all you city councilmen. <laughs> but on behalf of Carol Jamison, who has been our leader for Relay for Life for over 14 years and the committee that they are now planning the Relay for the 25th and 26th of April. I'm here to pick up this, but we have asked him with the majors, the mayor, and their blessing, he has said we could challenge all survivors to wear their shirt on Sunday, April the 6th. So everybody can see that they're survivors because we hear so many people calling different people saying, I am so frustrated, I'm real upset, I've give up because there's no way to beat this. So we are challenging the survivors to wear and contact the place that they worship at to ask them if they will, to at least ask them to stand up in there for a couple of minutes so people that has just heard the sadness from 2013 that they've been diagnosed with that six letter word that none of us want to hear, that they can look around and see, gee whiz, I heard all the bad things about losing my hair, being sick all the time, but I work with that lady or that man. And they, are, and they get a shot of inspiration and determination and courage to beat this six letter word to help more people have more birthdays and we thank all of you on behalf of Carol and the committee 
for your support of Relay for Life for raising funds and now so that it comes new medication and new inventions and we see more people being saved year after year. And you know what? Onslow County is probably the spark that has lit the fire for so many counties and states that have gone up and raised so much money in there for Relay. Because this, through the city council and the mayor and different people, we are one of the 51 top fundraisers for Relay in the, United, in the world, not just the United States. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Thank all of you citizens. Mr. LaRue, it's good to see you again. Keep fighting the fight. Next, I have a presentation. I'd like to ask Suzanne Nelson. I know you're here. I saw you earlier. There you are. She's the chairperson of the Environmental and Appearance Advisory Committee and the Jacksonville Tree Advisory Board Subcommittee. And uh, I have a little, little proclamation to make to you. This is Jacksonville has a long tradition of observing uh, Arbor Day and supporting beautification efforts. The city, the Jacksonville Tree Board, and the Environmental Appearance Advisory Committee worked to advance efforts that improve the appearance of our city. And by just driving around, you can see that a lot of improvements have been made. This is a lot nicer looking city than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, traditionally, during the Arbor Day observance, Jacksonville celebrates the meaning of Arbor Day, and trees are planted at a city park. The 2014 Arbor Day observance will be held on Friday, April 25th at Wooten Park, located on Cold Drive. And if you'll uh, <clears throat> allow me, I'll read this proclamation. Whereas Arbor Day is celebrated to emphasize what we believe, that we believe in the importance of tree planting as a legacy for future generations. And whereas trees protect land and structures by reducing runoff, binding soil, and minimizing flood damage. And whereas trees reduce the cost of controlling stormwater runoff, in addition to offsetting greenhouse gases from cars and homes. And whereas the city of Jacksonville, through our landscaping and urban forestry efforts, will continue to beautify our city by planning, caring for, and preserving our trees for future generations. Now, therefore, I, Sammy Phillips, Mayor of the City of Jacksonville, do hereby proudly proclaim April 25, 2014, as Arbor Day, in the city of Jacksonville, and I urge all citizens to celebrate this special day by supporting efforts of protecting our trees and woodlands and to further our city's urban forestry programs for the well-being of our present and future generations. Suzanne, thank you very much. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. On behalf of the Jacksonville Environmental and Appearance Advisory Committee and the Jacksonville Tree Board, we want to invite everyone to the 2014 Arbor Day observation, observation that will be at 9.30 a.m. Friday, April 25th. It will be at the Reverend E.W. Wooten Park, which is located off of Belfork Road along Ellis Boulevard. This year will mark our 34th year that the city of Jacksonville has been designated as a Tree City USA. This accomplishment is due to the actions of the mayor and the city council to fund and support actions that values trees in our community, and we thank y'all for doing that. We also have a special contest that will be taking place for those who would like to spread the word about valuing trees. We're looking for video stories that show the value of trees within our community. We'll have two divisions, a student and adult division, and the winner of each will receive a $50 gift card. You may find more details pertaining to the contest located on the City of Jacksonville website and the City of Jacksonville Facebook page. And the advisory committee would also like to thank the council for the commitment to the Clean and Green campaign. Our um, advisory committee is taking action to organize a city-wide cleanup <coughs> campaign during the month of April and will also be airing special information about the City of Jacksonville sanitation services on how they will pick up your curbside items and take them away. So we would like to use this spring as an inspiration to inspire all of Jacksonville to help keep the City of Jacksonville clean and green. So, thank you.
Well, the next uh, presentation we have tonight, uh, I'd like to ask Chief uh, Unera from the Police Department, or our Public Safety Director, and Captain Driggers. There you are. Also, Teresa Carter from their, our uh, Oslo County Tourism. The North Carolina Association of Events and Festivals announced the 2014 Showfest Excellence Awards during their annual meeting held in Charlotte on January 20th, 2014. Each year, the association honors and recognizes the best of the best in the festival and events industry in the state of North Carolina. National Night Out was selected as the 2014 North Carolina Event of the Year. Teresa? We've been doing this for about six years. Um, it is a major, major accomplishment for us to bring this award back home. But I do want to tell you, when I asked the judges after six years of trying for this award what made the difference this year, the one thing that they said about National Night Out is the police department did such a wonderful job, but the city of Jacksonville came together and you could tell it was a community effort and that everybody partnered together. So I think it's a wonderful uh, statement to Jacksonville. It's a wonderful statement to Onslow County and I congratulate y'all. Quite an, quite an award. Congratulations. Good job. And good job to everybody that played a role in uh, putting on this year's National Night Out. It's a team effort, definitely, isn't it? Definitely. Thanks. Thank you, Nash. Thank you. Chief, you might as well stay up here then. All right, now, oh, with a great deal of pleasure, I get to call up Officer Dale Silence with his wife, Cheryl, who's in attendance. You also have some of your relatives here with you tonight. Hey, they ought to come up here with you. <laughs> and bring the, and bring the, little, the young one, too, their daughter, Ellie. This is Officer Dale Silence. His parents are Alton and Stephanie Silence. Uh, you don't have to do anything. Just, Thank you. <laughs> just stand. Just we'll take care of the rest. How's okay. that? All right. Thank you. Thank you for coming. That's quite, a, that's quite an honor here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Dale Silence is a native of Onslow County, uh, graduating from Southwest High School in 1998. After serving at North Carolina Alcohol Law Enforcement, he began his career with the uh, Jacksonville Police Department on May 14, 2007, serving as a patrol officer. In January of 2009, he was selected as an investigator and assigned to the Special Operations Division where he currently serves. Detective Silence holds an associate degree from Coastal Carolina Community College as well as the Advanced Law Enforcement Certificate from North Carolina Training and Standards. Now, at this time, I assume you're going to hold the Bible for it. And I'll let you all step over to the microphone. And if you'll hold that and you'll repeat after me. <clears throat> I, Dale Silence. I, Dale Silence. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and maintain. That I will support and maintain. The Constitution and laws of the United States. The Constitution and laws of the United States. And the Constitution and laws of North Carolina. And the Constitution and laws of North Carolina. Not inconsistent therewith. Not inconsistent therewith. And that I will faithfully discharge. And that I will faithfully discharge. The duties of my office. The duties of my office. As sergeant. As sergeant. Of the City of Jacksonville Police Department. Of the City of Jacksonville Police Department. And maintain and uphold. And maintain and uphold. All the laws and regulations. All the laws and regulations. Of the City of Jacksonville, North Carolina. Of the City of Jacksonville, North Carolina. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Sergeant Silence.
just as an aside, just as an aside, I want to have you come over here just a minute. You and I share something now. Come here. This date is special for both of us. March 18th is the day that you were promoted to sergeant. Yes, sir. March 18th, 1974 was the year, the day and year I was sworn in as a Jacksonville police officer. 40 years ago. So we got something in common. Congratulations, Dale. It takes a lot of hard work to get where you're at, and, and the future's bright. Keep on plugging away. Appreciate what you do. Thank you, family, for coming. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate the, the opportunity to say a few words about uh, Sergeant Silence. You know, I, I think that one of the most important things that we do is promote new officers. And one of the things that really makes me feel good as an officer, you know, after 40 years, um, I know the mayor feels the same way, is that it, it really makes you realize that the department is in good hands. Uh, yesterday we had a press conference. We talked about the, uh, a, a case where we took a dangerous predator off the street. And it was because of the dedication of the officers, officers like uh, um, Detective Silence at that time, working on these cases to, to resolve them and to make our community safer. And it really does make my heart feel good in this community to know that we have great leaders who are going to move the department forward. So, Mayor, I appreciate it. Congratulations. Good luck. Thanks, sir. It's cheap, but I'm not done with you yet. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Way to go, bro. Next, I have a, a, this was the one that we added on. Uh, uh, I would like to ask Christy Pitchford if she would join me up front. Okay. On Saturday, April 5th, 2014, the Onslow County Safe Kids Coalition will be holding an event to raise awareness of childhood injuries and injury prevention during the summer in recognition, a recognition of Safe Kids Day and to encourage all residents to attend. We've prepared a proclamation, which I will read. Also, I want to note that uh, Chief Unero is also a member of the Safe Kids Coalition and, and part of, of the uh, uh, Partnership for Children, right? Exactly. <laughs> I would like to read this at this time. Whereas since 1988, there has been a 55% decline in the unintentional injury death rate among children ages 19 years and younger. And whereas notwithstanding this extraordinary progress, unintentional injury is still the number one killer of children in the US. And whereas around the world, a child dies from an unintentional injury every 30 seconds and millions of children are injured in ways that can affect them for a lifetime. And whereas Safe Kids Worldwide, a national network of over 600 coalitions, including the Onslow County Safe Kids Coalition, works every day to help parents and caregivers prevent unnecessary childhood injuries and fatalities. And whereas the Safe Kids Coalitions join with firefighters, first responders, medical professionals, children's hospitals, pediatricians, police officers, and other committed citizens in supporting child injury prevention. Now, therefore, I, Sammy Phillips, Mayor of the City of Jacksonville, do hereby proudly proclaim Saturday, April 5th, 2014, as Safe Kids Day in the City of Jacksonville, and call upon all residents of, this, of Jacksonville to join with me in supporting the efforts and activities of the Onslow County Safe Kids Coalition to prevent childhood injury and to dedicate each day to be keeping our most precious resource, our children, safe from injury. And I 
we'll present this to you. And would you like to say a few words? Uh, I would just like to say thank you very much to the council, Mr. Mayor, for their support, and also to an extend an, an invitation to everyone here to please join us during our Safe Kids Day event, again on April 5th, Saturday, from 10 to 2 at um, the Sam's Club uh, parking lot. We would like to see everyone there. It's a very fam uh, family-friendly event. So again, thank you very much for your thank support. Next, with it's with a great deal of pleasure that I'm going to ask uh, a couple members of our youth council that are present tonight, Elizabeth Nowlin and Vice Chair, she's the chairman, and Vice Chairman Robert Whaley. Uh, they're going to give us a report on some of the youth council's activity. Also, their coordinator, Carmela George, is present. I know uh, I saw her earlier. Okay. I saw her hand. There you go. Okay. If you would come to the podium, please. Elizabeth Nallen, Chairman of the Jacksonville Youth Council and Junior at White Oak High School. I have Vice Chairman Robert Whaley, a junior at Jacksonville High School, here with me tonight. We truly appreciate your continued support of the Youth Council and are happy to have the opportunity to briefly share activities that we have been doing with you tonight. Just a bit of history. The Jacksonville Youth Council came to be because the youth who came before me asked for it. Some students were selected by their, stu by their school to attend a community summit. They were asked to comment on various issues, and they came up with the idea that there should be a youth council. They wanted a voice for the youth, a connection to the government, and a chance to talk about their future. The city worked with Onzo School Board to make it happen, and today we are here as part of the Jacksonville Youth Council. We want to share a little bit about what the youth council has been doing. It can generally be divided into seven areas. Practicing governance, helping charities, learning about the community, serving the community, advocating for the youth, self-improvement, and serving the youth. We are a formal group, so there are elections, and officers take oath before you, the Jacksonville City Council. We learn much about the, the parliamentary procedure and what it means to be leaders within this process. Another area the Youth Council has worked with heavily in the past and continues to work with is to help charities. The Youth Council has decided who it wants to help and whether it is in service or providing funds. We believe strongly in the value of volunteerism and encourage all of our members to be involved regularly in community improvement efforts. The Youth Council regularly has special informational presentations at our meetings and have been allowed to participate in special training and learning opportunities that expands our knowledge of what we can do to make a difference in our community. Another area of activity has been to serve the community. Each year on the National Day of Service, we select a project to serve the community. We also participate in projects like Christmas Cheer Youth Day and Make a Difference Day each year and programs like Patriot Day and the Beirut Memorial Observances. The Youth Council holds monthly meetings at City Hall and oftentimes serves as a focus group for programs and projects who desire a youth perspective on issues. Former JYC leader successfully advocated for the Jacksonville Youth Center as a safe place for youth and continues to host, host and serve many youth activities and functions. Many of our meetings and events in involve youth empowerment activities which allow such instruction as leadership, etiquette, and public speaking. The Youth Council takes great pride in being able to provide positive events and activities for the youth. We hold events throughout the year to keep teens engaged and offer special activities and trips in the summer. Our newest initiative is Harmony, which stands for Helping All Reach More Opportunities Through New Youth Giving. It is a youth grants board, a partnership between the City of Jacksonville and the NC Caring Community Foundation. Harmony allows youth-led groups to apply for money and assist to create youth-directed projects that address community issues and challenges in this region. A board of young people makes the final decisions about which groups get money for the ideas for positive actions that support their peers. In conclusion, I would like to thank you, Mayor Phillips, and the council members for your continued support of youth pro pro 
projects, such as Sturgeon City and Harmony. I personally know that it will help me in the future and the endeavors that I have in the future. I speak for myself as well as Robert and the other youth council members and saying that I see the benefit in what these programs are doing in the youth and I would appreciate if they continued. Thank you again and have a good night. Thank you very much. <laughs> Elizabeth and Robert, I'll have to say that uh, when I sat down and met with y'all, it was last week or week before last. I, my time kind of runs together, but the, but that was such a such an energetic meeting. I thought, as far as getting it, it, getting a good perspective on 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 you, uh, as far as what your desires for your community and the future is going to be, and 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 how you should play a very important role in developing that community of the future, because you're it. You know, like I told you in our meeting. At some point, that baton, not the pen, but the baton is going to get passed, you know, and it's folks like you, you know, people with your energy, you know, with your desire to be fill leadership positions and your love of this community are the people that we look forward to guiding us through, you know, the days of the future. And I want to thank you very much, and I appreciate all the input that you give us. And again, like I said, we're going to energize our youth council. You know, we're going to get it energized. We're going to make we're going to make use of those good brains that are working inside that organization. And I thank you for coming to us tonight. Well, I, like I said, I, I've I've never been so impressed with some, with young people in my life as I was that day. I was bowled over by them. Thank you. All right. Moving on uh, with the meeting, I think that what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to take a real quick pause and I know some of you came strictly for the presentations tonight and you probably don't want to stay for the uh, the main part of the meeting so I'm gonna take a I'm gonna stretch my legs and and let y'all stretch yours and and leave if you choose to do so if you want to stay by all means please stay Spoken young lady. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From White Oak. Yeah, from White Oak, no uh, less. Yeah, yeah, from White Oak. <laughs> the gentleman did just, just as equally well from yeah, Jacksonville. <laughs> Great job.
I think they're here for the UDA. No, I got a uh, I think. phone call from it could be the satellite. Steve Morris wanted to know where he could find the basketball. The satellite is on TV. I don't know. It's on True TV. I think it's the UDA. Oh, the UDA? UDA is. Uh, Mr. Dr. Woodruff. We're going to go back in session now. Oh. I'm going to go back in the session with my microphone on. Okay. Uh, the first item we're going to look at is uh, number one on the in the agenda packet. This is a repeal the uh, repeal the city of Jacksonville zoning and subdivision ordinances, and adoption of the unified development ordinance and new official zoning map. And Ryan King, the uh, planning administrator, will be presenting this item. Ryan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. <laughs> After six short years. I finally stand before you asking that you consider adoption of the Unified Development Ordinance. The UDO, as we call it, it started back in 2007, December of 2007, with a scoping meeting um, where Clarion, well, Clarion, our consultant, met with City Council, Planning Advisory Board, City staff, and other key stakeholders within the community. They reviewed our current documents and ordinances discussed things that were working, were not working with our development ordinances, and toured the city and tried to get public input on the things that go into a code that I just described. From that, they prepared a diagnosis and annotated outline that they presented to the city staff and the steering committee that city council appointed. And they met once again with their findings in this outline with the staff the advisory committee the Planning Advisory Board, and the City Council. They established five goals. They included increased customer friendliness, streamline the development review, modernize the zoning districts and uses, improve the development quality within the Jacksonville jurisdiction, which is the city limits and the ETJ, and encourage redevelopment. They established the structure that our new Unified Development Ordinance 
entails. There's nine articles. This ordinance includes our zoning ordinance and our subdivision ordinance. So this blending those two ordinances into one document and explains the different processes that are associated with those two ordinances that are now blended together into one. Task three saw the drafting of the unified development ordinance. This was prepared in three modules and it was reviewed by staff. Comments were made by staff and submitted to Clarion. They made adjustments to the proposed draft that then went to the steering committee. One of the reasons why it took six short years was the steering committee went, by the, went through the ordinance page by page and identified concerns and things that they thought needed to be included, many of which the steering committee members are here tonight. Um, I've seen Councilman Warden, who at the time served as a planning board member, uh, Mr. John Pierce, Mr. Keith Walker, uh, I think I believe I saw Reverend Churchwell is here. And has, have I missed anybody else that served on the, the uh, Ms. Sheila Pierce, served on the steering committee to review this document. <clears throat> like I said, it was three different parts and we came up with the draft ordinance that is before you this evening. Wanted to go over through or go over some of the general structure of the ordinance. Article one, Nobody's going to read this part that often. It's just basically the uh, purpose and intent, what it applies to, like, for example, it's applicable in the city limits and in our ETJ, which is the extraterritorial jurisdiction, the area beyond one mile. It establishes rules for map and zone interpretations for the boundaries, and it also establishes the rules transitioning from the old code to the new code. One thing that this does, you can see on the right hand side, it provides flow charts on how things go from application through the approval process. Some other changes that this code includes is a one step conditional rezoning process. Currently we have a two step, so this will be a more streamlined process which meets the, the goals of being more streamlined. Site plan procedures, we've already adopted some of those because we have worked on this for six short years, we have already brought some of those changes before you. Now staff has the ability to approve development plans up to 25,000 square feet. Before that was 5,000. So we've already implemented many changes associated with the items found in, in this part of the code. One part that we have not adopted that we think will be of a great benefit is the administrative adjustment aspect. And that's going to give staff the ability to provide 10 or 25% depending on the type, um, development standard waivers based on individual site conditions. So if there's some site constraint, we are allowed to kind of vary the hard fast rule, which is what it used to be in the current code of 10 feet. If there's some thing that basically prohibits them to fully comply with the ordinance, we have a percentage that we can adjust. We believe that will be of great benefit given certain site constraints throughout Jacksonville. Another improvement is we're going to reduce the zoning districts down from the base zoning districts and the conditional use districts, which are 22 base districts, 22 conditional use districts, uh, and the military reservation. So we're going to go from 45 current districts to 14. The other part that this ordinance will include that our current ordinances do not is graphics, which will help make interpreting things and demonstrating how we measure certain things more easy to understand. One of the things staff has tried to do with this ordinance based on council's direction is minimize nonconformities. Anytime you adopt codes, you always have the opportunity of creating some nonconformities. We made it a point to pay close attention that we didn't increase setbacks. If anything, we um, decreased them so that we didn't create a nonconforming situation for the residences throughout Jacksonville. We also are bringing forth three planned development districts. As City Council may remember, you all have already adopted that in our current code that was taken from this unified development ordinance. So technically those will not be new because they're already in our current codes. Here's an ex a picture of the zoning districts. You can see on the screen that there's graphics, there's photos. Uh, uh, up-to-date, more modern purpose statement compared to our current districts. And then an easy to understand and follow table on the right hand side that identifies dimensional standards such as setbacks, maximum lot coverage, etc. 
another example of a diagram that you will see in the UDO to kind of help identify where those measuring points are to be measured from. This ordinance contains a use table. Currently, if you want to know what residential districts allow a church as a permitted use, you have to go through each one of the individual zoning districts to find out if you can construct a church within the zoning district. This ordinance, you will go to one table, which is in Article 4, and you will be able to see which zones in one table you can build a church within. We believe this will create some of that streamlined and more user-friendly aspects of the UDO. One thing that this code more clearly defines compared to our current ordinance is accessory uses. So you will have a table similar to the use table that identifies what accessory uses are, where they can go, and we will have general standards for them. An example of those are home occupations. You can have a home-based business in our jurisdiction, but there are certain things and provisions that you have to meet, such as only the residents of the home can work at that home-based business. This is where those standards will be found. We also have things that are temporary uses. This ordinance will more clearly define those temporary uses and where they can go and the standards associated with those. Currently, our ordinances do not specifically address those so it can become kind of cumbersome to try to figure out is it allowed, where it can go, what kind of provisions need to be put in place. Another example of the use standards uh, with the use table for accessory uses. In Article 5, you'll find the development standards. Uh, this section will contain exterior lighting provisions so that we try to keep uh, parking lot lighting and other types of outdoor lighting that spill over onto adjoining land uses that are not compatible with, so commercial next to residential, we will have lighting standards. We received input from Progress Energy at the time, now Duke Energy. Transportation impact analysis, no major changes there, although we have made some process changes uh, that Mr. Prenz put in place a year or two ago. The landscaping standards, we simplified those they've already been adopted so there's no new proposed landscaping standards that are in the studio because council has already adopted those and they're much more user friendly and easier to apply to a new development site and even to an existing development site some other things found in article 5 are the flight path overlay council's already adopted that so there's no changes there the downtown districts we're going to blend four downtown districts into two the two residential districts are going to go to one downtown residential district. The two commercial downtown districts are going to go into one downtown commercial district. Council's already adopted those. So everybody in the downtown district, they will see no change compared to what's in the code today versus tomorrow because that text has already been brought forth over the past few years as we made changes along the way. Article 5 also includes Article, uh, off street parking, loading, and circulation standards. We did adjust some of the parking ratios based on the steering committee's comments. When a development proposal comes before us, one of the requirements that the current ordinance has is based on the number of seats in a building. Well, when they're doing a development plan, sometimes it's kind of hard to determine what the occupant load will be at that time based on number of seats. So it's more of a per square foot base like some of our other parking standards are so we think that will be a a benefit there's also incentives for bicycle party, parking stacking requirements for drive-through currently we do not have any stacking requirements and that's why we end up with situations that uh, similar to a business here in town where the drive-through backs up onto the highways we also identify cross access requirements so that you don't have to get back onto the main roads you can kind of cut through parking lots many of which already exist today, although it hasn't been a standard of the city where you can pull in a Toys R Us and go all the way over to the Walmart shopping center without ever getting back onto Western Boulevard. The signage is moving from our current ordinance to the new ordinance. We're not proposing any changes with the sign standards. It was our intent to come back forward in after the UDO adoption and look at 
have an assigned committee and discuss the sign regulations in detail. One thing that this code includes that our current codes do not are design standards for small non-residential businesses, large non-residential businesses, multifamily, and single family. Some of the small non-residential design standards deal with building orientation on corner lots, the location of service, loading area, and rooftop equipment, a glazing requirement so that we don't end up with no glass in buildings, uh, materials, which is very minimal, and where accessory structures can go. On the large building, very similar standards. It's just for those buildings that are larger in nature. Multifamily design standards deal with orientation, size, and height. Once again, massing, materials, and where the garage and parking locations should be on site. Single family, very few uh, standards based on the workshops that we had with city council where we brought forward key issues to city council. Uh, the biggest ones were, you know, orientation. The foundation requirement of, I believe it's 18 inches, is included based on the feedback we received from council. And that there's some variability between houses, so it's not the same house on every lot side by side by side. The subdivision standards that are now found in this code, Article 6, it's primarily bringing forth our current standards. There wasn't a whole lot of things that we felt were wrong with our ordinances, so we're bringing them forward. We are changing some of the names so that we're more in line with industry standards. So our sketch plan will become, um, or basically our preliminary plan is our sketch plan moving forward. What we refer to as a general plan will now become a preliminary plan and then the final plat remains as is. One other item that's to note that City Council has seen some request of the multifamily along um, commercial corridors and commercial zone property where the cost per acre was much higher than say a residential subdivision. You've had a couple of fee waiver requests. We are proposing that we go to established per acre cost of raw land and put that in the fee schedule every year with the budget process and then that's what will be applied when the subdivision ordinance recreation land comes into play. That way it's, it's more equal across the board regardless of how much the raw land was. Another thing that uh, is a new standard for the subdivision part, Article 6, is we are creating a provision for cluster or conservation subdivisions. The purpose here is to, uh, or in, it's intended to save open space and it will be limited to single family. The idea is if you have 50 acres and you have some environmentally sensitive areas, floodplains, et cetera, that if you will reserve 50% of that acreage to remain natural, that you can build the same density on the other half of that development. So that would be something that the developer would have to desire to do, but it's a tool that will be in our toolbox that we currently do not provide for a new style of development. Once again, it will be an optional process that a developer would want to or would have to want to apply for. Nonconformities. City Council recently adopted the nonconforming section of our current ordinance. That was taken after a citizen requested it and it was adopted by City Council already. So staff has been applying that part already in our current code and we feel that it is working fairly well and we are not proposing any changes at this time. And that deals with uh, one of the problems we had before was if somebody came in and they wanted to do a small renovation project, they would have to bring the full site into compliance and that caused some problems where it was more to do work outside than what they were putting in the building. So this establishes provisions on when you bring the buffering parking signage into compliance. But like I said, that's already been adopted so there's no changes there. Zoning enforcement. This is a Article 8 and it just outlines the procedures to ensure compliance and correction of violations that may exist. So if somebody is operating that home-based business in their house and they're not following the codes, this establishes the procedures and how they abate the problem in order to eliminate the penalty there. Article 9, the final article, is definitions. It also includes a rule of measurement for dimension and bulk standards. It 
classifies the uses, use categories, and use type descriptions, and it consolidates all definitions into one central location. Uh, many times in the past with our current ordinance, something would come up and it, it wasn't clearly defined. This ordinance will better define and more clearly define things that have created problems in the past and terms that are used within the ordinance. So that led us to task four, the public hearing draft of the UDO, which has been completed and is before you tonight. City staff has gone out to the community and presented in several fashions, and I'll get into that here in just a second. The first one is um, the Planning Advisory Board. We presented that to them last February, and they recommended approval. So your Planning Advisory Board is supporting the adoption of this document. We've also gone to the Board of Realtors and presented the UDO, the Governmental Affairs Committee, the Alonzo County Home Builders, Chamber of Commerce Small Business Committee. The web page has a working database so that you can type in your address or find your address and see what your current ordinance is or current use zoning designation and what your proposed designation is and see the purpose statements of both of those districts to kind of get an idea of what that really means for your property, what it's transitioning to. We've also detailed information on the web page, which is at www.jacksonnc.gov slash UDO. We have two videos that city staff and the city manager prepared, Land Use 101 and 201, that has, they're about two 25 minute videos that describe these processes. And they've been airing on G10. They're also available on the webpage. We've also put in utility bill inserts. Now that doesn't mean this UDO is causing a change to your water rates. It's just been a way for us to get the word out to our citizens that this proposed change was forthcoming. And we've done that, I believe that was the March, February, and January, those utility bills. We also had three informational sessions, although one was iced out, so we canceled that because we didn't want to have anybody you know, feeling like they needed to come down to that meeting when the roads were icy, so we ended up with two sessions. They were open to the public, and we had several people stop by in each session to find out more about what the UDO was and how it would impact them. We also had a front page newspaper story, thanks to the Daily News, where they had called and, and got information to put a story out there. The general statute requirements we complied with. We went with the large mailing, which is more than 50 properties. It required that we put in two half-page ads between 10 and 25 days before tonight's hearing. We met those legal requirements. We also went above and beyond that and put a full-page ad in the newspaper prior to that to try to get the word out that this ordinance was forthcoming. Everybody that's outside, according to the Alonzo County Tax Office, that resides outside the general circulation of the Jacksonville Daily News received a letter. We also posted signs throughout the city of Jacksonville to bring awareness that there was a, a hearing tonight at 7 p.m. We also utilized our Twitter and Facebook accounts for alerts about these activities. So what are your next steps? Well, when I sit down here in just a second, the next step will be to open the public hearing. And here, if there's any folks here that want to speak, ask questions, whatever it may be, for the public hearing process. And then city council can consider whether or not to adopt this book, which we would encourage and hope that you would do so. One thing that we've basically put in place is an optional usage clause, which means if somebody wants to use the new UDO, should council adopt this tonight, that they can optionally use it between now and June 30th, 2014. It will be completely voluntary. It'll be their choice. We're proposing a delayed effective date for those projects that may be in the works so that this new ordinance replaces the current ordinance effective July 1st, 2014. The existing zoning map is before you. It also includes the flight path overlay districts, the adult business overlay, and the billboard overlay. The proposed zoning, that includes the same adult business overlay, the same flight path overlay, same billboard overlay. One, one key point to mention here, 
with the last public hearing or open house session we had, there were some concerns raised thereabouts that same time that multifamily apartment complexes that are along Western Boulevard, for example, would become non-conforming. So we looked at that and they indeed would have become non-conforming. We have changed the proposed zoning district for just those apartment complexes that we identified to residential multifamily high density in order to avoid the non-conforming situation, to divert that from happening. We discussed that with some of the people that raised the concerns that had existing facilities, about seven or eight here in town, and they communicated that this relieved the concern that they had about creating the non-conforming situation. Beyond that, residential stays residential, commercial stays commercial. So, some frequently asked questions that I thought I'd go ahead and share right now in case somebody hasn't asked or if there's somebody in the audience. How is this affecting my property? Well, if you're in Northwoods, you're zoned residential. If council adopts this tonight, tomorrow they're still residential. There's no change there. If you're on Western Boulevard and your property is zoned commercial today, tomorrow your property is still commercial unless you're one of those apartment complexes that has an apartment complex on the ground that we're proposing to make a change from commercial to residential multifamily high density in order to not create a non-conforming situation. Another question that we received is how will this affect my tax value? I would encourage you to call Harry Smith, the Alonzo County Tax Assessor, to find out what this would do to your tax value. But I would suspect if it's residential today and it's residential tomorrow, it's probably not going to change a whole lot. But I would say that they would need to get that confirmed from Mr. Smith. This has nothing to do with the recent Alonzo County tax reassessment. That is a totally separate matter. It has nothing to do with the Unified Development Ordinance. Another thing that we've heard asked us, am I being annexed? No, this is not an annexation. If you are in the ETJ today, you will be in the ETJ tomorrow. We are not changing boundaries. We are not annexing any properties. Another question is, well, how do I learn more? You can call one of city staff, we've got a, like a hotline number set up at 938-5056. Jeremy, Abigail, and myself, we get many phone calls a day since we started advertising this UDO. We will try to answer your questions. You can come down to City Hall, we'll be glad to sit down and meet with you. You can also find information on the webpage that I gave to you a few moments ago at www.jacksonnc.gov slash UDO. Where can I get a copy of the UDO? If council adopts this, we are gonna have it online, which is there now on that web page, but we also have it available on CD-ROM. It's about 471 pages, so it's, rather, it's a rather thick document. Here's a copy. So it's a thick document. So it'd be better than charging paper cost, having it on the web page, which is free for anybody to go and find it online, or to come pick up a CD-ROM here in Jacksonville. Uh, Glenn has been nice enough to Pull up the web page so City Council can see it. Here you can find information about the UDO and the draft code that is before you tonight is at the bottom of the screen here. Found at this link, there's the video. The, the green link down here at the very bottom is where you can find this right now if you're sitting in the living room and you got a laptop in your lap. And at this time, I will be happy to answer any questions that uh, city council may have of me. Council, any questions of Mr. King? Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I would ask Dr. Woodruff or Mr. Carter if there's anything that they would like to add. I have a question here. I've got a question for Ryan. Okay. Ryan, um, I want to discuss the uh, Western Corridor a little bit okay. more. So what you're saying is that the multifamilies that were located on the Western Extension were non-conforming based on the current zoning that you're proposing, but we took those out to make them conforming. I can actually show you right here on the use table. If you, let's see, dwelling multifamily right, I guess I advanced the slide. So I guess what I'm asking is they're they're in the multifamily uh, zoning now. Correct. They're proposing. Haven't we set a precedence though for that commercial corridor with those there? 
already no. currently? You, you have not. What you have done over the years is you have looked at the development of commercial property for residential on an individual case. And what you have done through council action is you have determined whether that's an appropriate act or not. Uh, recently, what you had was a rezoning by one of the engineering architectural or engineering surveying companies in town that you will recall did the reverse. Pardon me if you'll hold comments, please. Sir. Sir. Thank you. Okay. But what you have been doing in the past is individually approving each of those multiple family complexes. What Ryan is saying is that when we and I have to commend John Pierce, uh, you know, John being an NC State fan, he looks at all the details, and he pointed out to us about a week ago that the map would have made them all non-conforming. That was never your intent, it was never the staff's intent. We had two courses of action we could have taken on that. We could have made them a permitted use in the commercial corridor district, or we could have gone back and rezoned it to high density multiple family. Because of concerns that you and others have heard regarding the overbuilding of multiple family, we felt to allow that to be a permitted use by right where someone could simply come in and build was not good for the market and was not something that we as a staff believed you as a council wanted. That what you as a, as a council are interested in is making sure that we're not overbuilt and where possible, we have reasonable processes to determine whether something should be rezoned. Therefore, we chose, but it's your final decision, to reclassify all of the existing multiple family on Western where they are in fact multiple family today. If you approve this today or two weeks or a month from now, they will be conforming. On the other hand, vacant property we left as commercial because we have all agreed that the Western Corridor is where we believe a lot of commercial development is positive and should go. It does not preclude at any time that someone could come in and file a rezoning on vacant property. And that rezoning to multiple family would of course go through a process. And that process will be the standard rezoning process so that you, the planning commission, the citizens can determine do we need more multiple family? And number two, is that the right location for it? So one of the issues before you, if you choose to address that, A or B, you can say tonight, we agree with staff, we're gonna leave everything that's vacant, commercial corridor, and we'll handle them on individual cases. On the other hand, if you believe that it should be by right, where you have no say in it from this point on, you can simply make it a permitted use in corridor commercial. Most important thing though is, I want to assure you as a council, this action will not make any of the properties that are currently multiple family on Western Boulevard non-conforming. They will all be conforming. Just for knowledge, uh, under, under B1, what are permitted, some of the permitted uses? The current zoning? Under the proposed. Under the proposed, B1 goes away and it's corridor commercial. Corridor commercial. Mm -hmm. Because in the, in the past, it would have been included under a special use. Yes, it was a special use permit, okay. which required a public hearing. Right. And special use permit is not technically a rezoning, but for all practical purposes. It went through the process of the rezoning a process. And special use. Yeah. Ryan, can you read some of those? I can. Uh, commercial uses in the corridor commercial include kennels, indoor and outdoor, vet clinics, um, restaurants with drive throughs restaurants without drive throughs uh, banks and other financial institutions, uh, parking decks and garages, uh, vehicle storage, funeral homes, laundromats, pawn shop lending institution, repair establishment, Arcade, indoor commercial recreation, outdoor recreation, swimming pools, theaters, uh, bars, taverns, nightclubs as a special use permit, convenience stores with, without gas sales, convenience stores with gas sales, drug stores with drive throughs, drug stores without drive throughs. 
There is, a, there is an, another option that we could make it a special use rather than a permitted use or, or actually, and I think that would be easier than trying to go through a rezoning process. So, you know, it's possible there is a third option that we could make it a special use. In which case, the planning, planning advisory board and the city council then get the chance to look at it and talk about it. But I can assure you it's a, it should be a lot easier than a rezoning. Just let me address that. Just, just keep in mind, uh, Mr. Warden and council, that a rezone is a special use instead of you are. Use. It's a legislative action. So you have much more leeway sitting as a council in reference to a rezone because you're the legislature. You can pass it or not pass it. With a special use permit, if they meet A through G, then you are bound to uh, allow it. It is a uh, quasi-judicial hearing and so forth. So again, the council would not have as much leeway in, in that regard. And I just wanted to point the, the, uh, the two legal differences to you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Thomas. So back to what Mike alluded to. If you have a B1 today, then the multifamily is not a problem. Is that correct? Currently, you can build a multifamily apartment complex in a B1 district. See, because that's incongruent with what I've been understood, I guess, because when people ask me, I say, well, you're not really losing any rights. We're just changing the the names of the different zonings but in fact somebody that owns B1 property is losing a right via this adoption that would be correct see that that I think the question you have to ask though uh, is that actually a right you want them to have and you have to decide that as the elected officials of the city uh, I will say to you as a land planner from many years just open your cor your corridor commercial for multiple family to go anywhere is simply not a good idea. Exactly. There are there are reasons why you have zoning districts. I will also say to you that your track record is exemplary in that I in the four years I've had the privilege to work with you, I have never seen you deny a rezoning that should have been approved. It, it's not like you are anti-growth. It's not like you are, are negative to development. I would also say to you again, though, you do have a responsibility to protect the value of property that is developed as well as protecting the property rights of those who own vacant property. We know every day we have complaints about the fact that the community is overbuilt. Now, there are very few ways you can get into regulating the market. One way you do get into regulating the market is determining whether a zoning should be approved or denied. If you feel that you do not want to regulate vacant property that is on the corridor commercial and you want to allow the multiple family to go in, then you should direct the ordinance to be changed. If you believe it is better for the council to look at multiple family on a zoning by zoning basis, as long as we're not making any of the current non-conforming, then that's the way you should so direct. The staff's position though is, is clear. From a planning standpoint, I will tell you as your manager, you should regulate vacant commercial property. You should reserve it for the development of commercial. And let me tell you another reason why. Multiple family and single family pay taxes they do not generate the taxes to overcome the service requirements in most cases. You need to protect vacant commercial property because that is where your tax base is built the strongest, that is where the services are the least, and that is where we believe you should guard the vacant commercial. But it again is your choice as with anything legislative with the city. Thank you. Any other questions of Mr. King? Thank you, Ron. So this time, this being a legislative action of the council, I'm going to open up the public hearing in this matter. But prior to opening the public hearing, I'm going to let you know that uh, we do have some rules, council rules. Uh, when you, uh, if you come up you, to the lectern, which one do you want them to use? The right. Okay, come to this lectern here. 
Uh, when you get there, I'll ask you to clearly state your name and address so the clerk can record that. Uh, each speaker will be allowed only one opportunity to speak, so please make sure you organize your thoughts before coming to the podium. Uh, we have allotted a maximum time per speaker of no more than five minutes. And uh, we, uh, any uh, groups that are here represented tonight, if you would have a spokesperson instead of one person after the other getting up and saying the same thing, if you'd have one spokesperson representing the group. Uh, in the interest of time, we ask that if any, another speaker has already raised a point or addressed your concern, that it not be repeated. Um, so at this time, I'm going to recess the regular city council meeting and open the public hearing in this matter. If there's anyone present that wishes to speak to this issue, please indicate so by raising your hand. Mr. Pierce. John Pierce, 405 Johnson Boulevard. I'll try to be brief. I had the privilege of serving on the steering committee. And to be quite honest with you, when I reviewed this document, of course, it's a very thick document, about 400, right at 500 pages. But I was a little shocked when I found out in the commercial corridor that multifamily was not permitted as we see it today. I know we spoke about Western Boulevard, but we failed to look at, have we looked at Gum Branch Road? There's several projects on Gum Branch Road that was built on the B1 zone. We made no mention of that. I would hope that we would look at those prior to making those non-conformant uses. Um, and I, th I think one thing I should point out to the council that residential is permitted as long as it's upstairs above a business. And I would agree that the, the problem that I have, and I don't know if I can fully explain it, if I have a commercial piece of property a thousand foot deep and I want to go three or 400 feet off the road and build one, let's just say it's a tax credit deal. Well, the state has got to feel assured that it's going to be a, a use that would be approval before they'll vote for the tax credits. Well, if I'm a landowner right now, I would be reluctant to resume my property to residential use only, and it would be in the commercial area. So I feel, as what Mr. Warden had alluded to, that I feel like it should be permitted, even at least with a special use, because a lot of these projects are not right up on the highway, but they may be three, four, five hundred feet deep such as Wellington Grove. That's off, off the highway 800 feet or 1,000 feet. In fact, I've got, we're planning a commercial project in front of it now. But if we adopt this ordinance, it would not be permitted to go there. But, and I agree that in these higher end apartment projects, we are overbuilt. But there's still a need for people to have some subsidized housing in certain areas. If we adopt this ordinance, what are we gonna do, put them out in Halls Run? because they're not going to be permitted in a lot of areas they're permitted now. And I was really shocked when I looked at it and seen it. There was going to be so many nonconformities. But I do applaud the city for looking at it, the staff and the manager. But we have not mentioned Gum Branch, and I hope we have looked at Gum Branch Road as well. I don't know. I've not heard it mentioned tonight. There would be several properties that would be nonconforming. And I would also, again, like to remind the council that it does permit multifamily as long as you live above where you work. Well, the only reason years ago people done that, they didn't have any other options. They didn't have the luxury of having another home somewhere. I, I don't believe anybody sitting on that council wants to work a business and, and, and close your business and go upstairs to live unless you had to. I know I don't, and I, I would agree. I would be tickled if we could get a Mayfair. I don't see us getting a Mayfair in the near future. Maybe one day we will. But not only fronting, but right directly on the highway, this eliminates properties at seven and 800 feet that are zoned 1,000, 1,200 feet, B1 zone currently. That means no multifamily in those. I don't think that's really what we want. The problem is if I apply for a state tax credit deal, they got to know in March or whatever that it would fit within the zone. Unless I come for a rezoning, but now I can supply them a special use in the B1 zone, and, and they, would, they may approve it, it may get funded. But why would I, would I want to change my property to residential when I need it to be commercial? if it didn't get funded in the fall. So it really does create a dilemma for a need. There still is a need for some moderate to low income housing, which we don't have. And if we adopt this, I'm afraid we're going, and look, I served on the steering committee and I know there'll be some glitches, but I think we'd, we worked over two years, page by page. And there was a lot of people that were diligently working on it, but I was, I was a little surprised, and I don't know how it got in there, but it did. But I think we tried to fix it. But I, 
I do want to make sure that we are looking at gum branches in some other areas, not only, not only Western Boulevard. If you've got any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them. Thank you, Mr. Pierce. Thank you. Other? <coughs> yes, sir. Good evening, Council. My name is John Friesen. I'm an attorney from Newber, and I represent East Carolina or East Carolina Coastal, East Carolina Development Group, ECCDI. I'm sorry I'm getting the name wrong today. I know, I know you, I know um, the council members brought up one very important point that uh, my client had contacted me about, and it was about this B1 zoning change to the commercial corridor. Um, the planning director had mentioned there were seven or eight uh, apartment complexes or multifamily uh, residential complexes that would be impacted, but there were actually somewhere around the neighborhood of 22 or 23 that would be affected by this change. Uh, I'll give the council a, a few of them. Uh, the names Liberty Point, Windsor Place, Glenstall, Meadowsgate, Arlington West, Plantation, Phoenix Park 1 and 2, Fox Hollow, Wellington Grove, the reserves. These are some of the, the many multifamily complexes that will be impacted by this change. The change is significant because, as the other councilman, I think Mr. Thomas mentioned, that they will lose a significant right. Some of these developments aren't completed. I am aware of one that is that could be expanded, that more multifamily residences could be built on that property. And if the use is non-conforming, then the new zoning ordinance prohibits an expansion of that. It, it says, according to that subsection, a non-conforming use should not be enlarged, expanded in an area occupied or intensified. Uh, so there are several neighborhoods and several developments that need to be considered. Uh, before I think this ordinance in the zoning ordinance is adopted and changed. Thank you. Other hands? All right, calling once, twice. Do I? Oh, okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> Good evening, Reverend Brown. Yes, sir. Bless you. I'm Pastor James Brown. I'm pastor of First Baptist Church, Broadhurst Street, and I live at 202 University Drive. Um, our uh, mission, I want to know basically uh, what the proposed changes will uh, be for that, whether that would be uh, a conforming use or non-conforming use, if it were a non-conforming use, I want to know what we'd have to do to be a conforming uh, entity. The same is true about the church that I passed. And one last thing, and that is a number of my members stay in the area close to First Baptist, the old, well, the Second Chance Mission now. And I want to know that if we adopt this, that those persons are not going to be displaced because much of the building that is going on in the area um, basically is much more expensive. I have members that can't afford to move. They are not in a situation where moving is in their future. So I would want to know that all of them are being protected. And I would hope that the council, our mayor, and all of you will look at them and see their plight if we adopt the UDL. Thank you, Reverend Brown. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Dr. Woodruff, uh, in response to his question, nobody would be displaced by this ordinance. Right? I think what I would suggest is that uh, you continue with the public hearing, and then as soon as that's over and you close it, we will begin to address okay. these concerns. Thank you, Reverend Brown. We're going to address your concern. Thank you. Yes, sir. Is there anyone else present that wishes to speak? Yes, sir. This is all new to me. Our first. I'm a Marine here. I've been here for 33 years. My name is Ellis Singletary. I live on Wolf Swamp. And uh, my wife joined the senior citizen at the carnival. And uh, I think she paid 
$17 because we weren't in the zone. And I live off of uh, Wood Swamp on the Kettle, Kettle Blue area. And I wanted to know, so I, she said, we're going to have a picnic. And she said, uh, because we're not in the zone, you're going to have to pay also $17 for the picnic because you're out of the zone. Now, to me, being here uh, 19 years with the Department of Correction, 22 years in the Marine Corps, I want to know from you all uh, the kind of charges that for non-residents. So we're talking two different worlds here, right? Am I correct? What I will do, though, is after the public hearing, I'll have one of our staff members uh, talk with you about this and, and answer your question for you. Okay. Thank you. What was your last name again? I didn't Singletary. Hear. Singletary. Thank you, Mr. Singletary. Thank you. That's the out of city in city thing. Yeah. Is there anyone else that wishes to speak? Please indicate by raising your hand. Yes, ma'am, in the back. My name is Kelly Victor. I live at 201 Sandpiper Place in Holly Ridge, which is actually near Sneeds Ferry. Um, I currently live in a subdivision that has about seven houses in that subdivision. We have in the last two years um, had a Taco Bell built in our subdivision and now there is a multifamily apartment complex or townhomes that are supposed to be going up right on the other side of my neighbor's home, so very close to my house. My home value has dropped tremendously um, and once these go up I'm sure it will drop even more. Um, to the point where I can't resell it and renting when I have new property for rent going up right next door is also going to be very difficult. So that, that property hasn't been developed yet and it seems like it's been stalled for some reason. I've talked to Mr. King, um, but he has not returned several of my phone calls since then about um, who's maintaining the road because the road is not maintained by the state. The permit was denied. Um, so I'm not even sure with all the work trucks going up and down the road, who is supposed to be fixing the potholes. Um, we never had an HOA instated as far as I know since the development went up. I'm just wondering how this is going to affect my neighborhood. Um, if there's a change or even if there isn't a change, um, I don't know what's going on or how there is a fast food restaurant within, I mean, I could wave to the people in the fast food restaurant. <laughs> And there is now these townhomes that are supposed to be built right next door to my house. Um, so I'm no longer in a subdivision. And it's going to be hard to resell my home. I have three small children who used to play outside, but now with the traffic, the drive through, um, it's not as safe. So I'm just wondering how these, how these ordinances are going to affect my property outside of Jacksonville city limits. Well, uh, honestly, they're not going to affect your property. Um, Could you clarify again, where do you live? Coastal Village off of Highway 210. Yeah, okay. Yeah, There's the Taco Bell there. You're, you're well outside of our, our jurisdiction, so this change in the ordinance shouldn't affect you at all. Okay, because I received a yeah. letter from you. Oh, really? Yes. Uh, why don't you have And I've talked to Mr. King yeah. Um, yeah. because I was told I'm not, we're still in Onslow County. Mm -hmm zoning right. but i haven't gotten any answers as far as how is there a fast food restaurant that was allowed to be built inside of our subdivision you have to actually drive into okay. our subdivision to access the drive-through and to leave the drive-through and how there is now this new development going up right on the other side of my neighbor's home do me a favor after the meeting stick around for a few minutes i want one of the staff people to talk with you and explain something okay explain it to you thank you Thanks. what's your last name again i'm, I'm sorry i can't hear victor that. Thank you, Ms. Victor. Thanks. If you'll hang around, though, afterwards, I appreciate it. Anyone else? Okay. Going once. Twice. And we'll close the public hearing in this matter. And, Council, you're being asked to... Um... Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Woodruff. Go ahead. You know, first of all, uh, we appreciate everybody's concern because this is not a minor matter. 
What I'd like to do is ask one of the staff members if they would go with Ms. Victor and explain uh, some of her concerns outside. Uh, for the public, the property that she is talking about is not within the city limits. It is also not within the city's ETJ, extraterritorial jurisdiction. So there's absolutely nothing this ordinance does that will impact her property in any way because that's county zoning. But we'll have, uh, see Abigail has gone out to, to talk with her. Uh, relative to the matter uh, that Reverend Brown talked about, good to see you, sir. Appreciate you coming out tonight. Uh, I believe that you're talking about the, uh, the building, the brick church that is there on generally Court Street. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, Ryan, can you or one of the staff address the uh, issue relative to the church? Jeremy? Uh, here, so the audience can hear the... As far as Mr. Brown, his specific question, I don't even know what the property is zoned right now. I mean, I'd, that's why we've had the public meetings, the call-in sessions, to try to find out very specifics down to the property level. I mean, I'll be happy to, to get with him and explain the current proposed but I can't rattle that zoning and, and how that would impact his property right now. If it's residential, it's going to be residential. If it's commercial, it's going to be commercial. But I mean, getting down to the specifics, I mean, we would have to look at what it's zoned and, and go through that. I think the most important thing that we can certainly tell you is this. If, that, if the facility is currently used as a homeless shelter, which my understanding is it is. There's nothing in this ordinance that will cause you to close that homeless shelter. There is nothing in this ordinance that would cause the persons who are in that shelter to be displaced. There is also nothing in this ordinance that would cause anyone who lives in a single family home, an apartment complex, a duplex, anything downtown where they're currently living. There's nothing in this ordinance that would cause those persons to be displaced. So there's no, really, I mean, this is certainly about a new zoning code that is, that is, while we said it was simplified, it's still pretty complex. But it will not displace persons in any way. What we can certainly do, though, is verify what your current zoning is for the homeless shelter, and then we can tell you under the new downtown zoning, if that's what it's in, whether that's a permitted use or whether that would become non-conforming. But even if it becomes non-conforming, it doesn't mean that you can't continue to operate. What it would mean, though, is that you could not expand it if it was non-conforming. But again, we can look at the specifics and be happy to meet with you and set up an appointment to answer that question. The Let's see, Mr. Singletary, on the fee, I believe you must be talking about the, the fee schedule for renting park facilities. Is that what you were talking about? Okay. Okay. So said, that's what I was speaking of. I mean, do they, I mean, I guess the, the, what the building or, or something have, you have a project where the citizens outside of the city has to pay uh, for public use because I go there to vote. Yes, sir. And I'm not, and I'm not tired. Well, I can, I can assure you we're not going to vote you to, we're not going to charge you to vote. That's a great American thing. We appreciate <laughs> you doing that. Uh, let me address that for just a minute. There is a fee schedule that the city council adopts for all of our recreation facilities. Now, anybody, whether you're a citizen taxpayer inside the city or whether you're a county taxpayer, of course, we're all county taxpayers, whether you live inside the city or not, you can come and you can, you know, play in the parks. That's what we're, you know, we're, we're there. But if you actually want to participate in a sporting event, like join one of the little league programs or even the men's softball program, or if you want to rent a picnic shelter. Because those facilities were built by city tax money, not county tax money, there is a differential in fees. 
Now, your particular thing relative to being tr having your wife being charged for some type of picnic, I'll be happy to meet with you after this meeting and try to clarify that. But I do want to explain that for the use of facilities other than just open parks, the council does have a differential because as taxpayers inside the city, they have already contributed. But if you'll stay a moment afterwards, I'll be happy to talk with you about that, that matter. Thank you. Um, there was one other item on the list, if I may. Yes. Okay. BCCDI, uh, Keith Walker and Mark McCluskey were kind enough to share that list, and we went down the list after we had already looked and canvassed the entire city, because anybody that was an existing apartment complex that was zoned business one, we converted to residential multifamily high density so they would not become nonconforming. Beecham Apartments on 17 South, Cornerstone uh, Condos, which is on Liberty, the entire city. And uh, so we went through that list and we appreciate them sharing that list with us. So we have gone down that list and we have checked all of those as well as the entire city. I think, Mayor, the, the comment that I would make is um, the real issue is what do you want to do with the vacant commercial property? As the attorney has very wisely told you, as a UNC graduate and excellent attorney, he has said it is your choice to determine do you want a legislative action? What was the other term you used? Quasi-judicial. Or a quasi-judicial action. You could, as Mr. Warden has suggested, you could set up in the corridor commercial that it be a special use. That is a different process than rezoning. I would say to you that of the three options available, make it a permitted use, make it a special use, or make it a rezoning, the one that the staff would definitely recommend you say no to is a permitted use. If you feel more comfortable with it being a special use permit, that is your, your decision. If you're more comfortable having it to be rezoned, that again is your decision. Mr. Mr. Pierce makes some valid points on that. The one thing we would ask is please do not make it a permitted use by right in the corridor commercial. Now, beyond that, uh, the options available to you obviously tonight are to, uh, to vote yes or no, to make amendments yes or no to postpone this for two weeks and give staff direction that you want more information brought back about some of these points. The one thing I would remind people and all of us is we've been at this six years, another two weeks isn't gonna matter. If you're ready tonight, we're comfortable. If you're not ready tonight, you know, like I said, we've been at it six years, six years and two more weeks is not gonna Mr. Mayor, I would like to get this put on the floor for consideration. So I would make the motion that the council repeal the zoning and subdivision ordinances, adopt the UDO, Unified Development Ordinance, and the new official zoning map, including existing adult business, billboard, flight plan, overlay districts, based on the findings of the fact A through D being found in the affirmative, the zoning advances the public interest, and with the corrections, staff recommends for the zoning along the corridors on Western Boulevard. Is that covered accurately? I don't understand. We, we don't even need that, Mr. Bennett, because we've already made those corrections. Okay, to, that's to fine. That, just as you <clears throat> just printed there. So that is your motion. Yes, sir. I'm getting kind of weary. I'm on. I'm on a dies without a, uh, without a second. I'd like to uh, make a motion that we uh, um, we do what Mr. Bittner suggested, except that I would like to see us make uh, multifamily a special use permit in the commercial corridor. Second. Okay. Any discussion, Council? May we ask for clarification? Okay. okay. If, this, if this motion passes, all of the map that we have shown 
in the commercial corridor where we were rezoning it to multiple family. I'm assuming that the motion says that that will be reversed to corridor commercial and that a special use will be applied to those or are you suggesting that the all of the multiple family that exists today be left as the map shows it multiple family but that the vacant commercial corridor will then have the the special use permit could you clarify that part yeah, of the motion I like I like what you just said yes sir I think that uh, let's leave those that are that you've changed to multifamily leave those but let's make the vacant reflect the special use if if so if so passed thank you for the clarification discussion discussion mayor um you know i i started the conversation i'm still a bit uncomfortable um and i you know we've we've spent six years on this as actually mayor phillips and i had just come on the board as rhonda parker uh started this uh at that time so it's been almost eight years uh, i just believe that before for me to make a final decision i would i would prefer a little bit more in-depth study on the implications of the special use and of the just standard rezoning as, as presented uh, i think mr pierce brought up a great point we really need to look at gum branch we really need to look at all these commercial parcels and and really make a good decision for me, I'm uncomfortable voting one way or another at this particular time. Um, I, I think there's some valid concerns. I think we're rushing into a vote, and I would ask that my fellow council members would defer uh, for till the next meeting to, to gather this information and to have some valid information before us to make a final decision. Is that a motion? Second. Second. I, I just withdraw. I, I, I was going to say I'll, I'll withdraw my motion. Let's, let's get that we'll just withdrawn and let the, the motion second to defer and we'll defer second. to the, set, okay. the next meeting. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Any, fine. any particular instruction? Okay with that? That? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with that. I just can we continue the discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay. I, I'm, I'm certainly fine with that. I certainly don't want to push a, a decision down anybody's throat here. Uh, I think Randy brings up a very, very valid point in that um, people have bought commercial land under the current B1 designation <laughs> with the anticipation and the understanding that multifamily is a permitted use. We're changing the game on that right now without them having an opportunity to change. They can't change the fact that they now own this property. We've been okay with Historically, we've been okay up to this point with approving multifamily uh, complexes in a B1 business zone. To my knowledge, I don't know that we've turned any down. We're all concerned about the overbuilding of multifamily housing here in Alza County, in Jacksonville in particular, and residential. But I think the market has now seen that there is not a, it's not a, the developers are seeing that this is not a good place right now or a good time to build multifamily housing. I don't want to, I, I think the, to given that a chance to use a special permit gives, keeps their rights, I don't really want to take their rights away from them. They have spent a lot of money in many cases for commercial property with the expectation that under the current zoning B1 they would be allowed to build multifamily. They may choose not to but that may be something they'd like to keep. So, um, But I'm certainly okay with deferring the decision. I, I think any time that you can communicate and talk about other options I think you make a better decision. I'm certainly not opposed to that. Well, I think, you know, the staff and, and the volunteers who've sat on these committees for so many years have done such a tremendous job, and here we are at the juncture. And if there's some concerns, I think we ought to go ahead and, and, and go through the diligent effort of, of making sure that we have all the information necessary to uh, make a final decision. I think it would help everyone. Well, let's, let, let's get some more information. Okay. Instead of having an up and down vote, we'll, we'll get our information together, have some more discussion on it. And uh, 
I, you know, another thing is too is with Mr. Willingham not being here tonight to have the full council because the full council has been involved in this whole process. So uh, I think it would be best to have everybody here. You had some add. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I came to the meeting, I thought prepared to vote this in, and uh, I guess my main concern is that I now realize I didn't have a full understanding. Of it, I thought through the process that I had gained somewhat. I mean, obviously, I don't know 400 and some pages worth of details, but uh, I, I did have a misconception mm -hmm. as to what was actually going to occur because people had asked me specifically, "Am I going to lose rights?" And I was felt I was assuring them that no, we're going to change the streamline the process. It's just going to be the same rose by a different name and so i uh that that's my main concern that i, that I didn't understand possibly what i was going to do well our yes. apology yeah. from the staff standpoint of not uh clarifying that point yeah. Just one, one last comment i, I want to thank the uh the steering committee uh, that steering committee was made up of uh, developers real estate people uh a pastor in the community uh, business people, just regular citizens, people trying to assist the staff in the city in, in, in bringing in this new development ordinance. You know, I think one of the main complaints that I've heard about the, the, the Affordable Care Act, you know, there's probably some good things in there, but none of the, none of the legislatures really got a chance to read that thousand page document. Well, here we've had a 450 page UDO that I can assure you that the staff and that steering committee looked at every page, in every case, every paragraph. We may not have looked at every word, but, but page by page, 450 pages, that thing was gone through with a fine tooth comb, argued back and forth, ideas kicked around, and, and, and it's, uh, I think, a, a good effort. So I want to thank the steering committee for, for their due diligence and and uh, I certainly have no problem in, in as, as Dr. Wood just said, and what's another two weeks, so. Uh, Doc, yes, Dr. Woodruff, can I just, um, just say on behalf of the citizens, is there any possible way that while we are um, mulling over what we're going to do with this particular ordinance, if we can put back on the table the cancel meeting due to the inclement weather to give citizens an opportunity to have that third meeting that they lost. Um, and Council Member Warden did an excellent job in terms of talking about the various different um, people in the community, your stakeholders who really had um, a part in this establishment of this um, UDO, but also recognize that sometimes even the citizens um, may sometimes feel that they still don't have a voice because they may feel that government is going to do what government is going to do. I would also encourage those individuals um, to come out to this third meeting and be a part of this process because even though it was already mentioned that no one would be displaced because of this, um, if there's any way, um, let's see, I don't mean to be rambling, but just let's say for instance, if you have a particular area in the city where is not zoned for mobile homes, but you currently have mobile homes in that particular um, area. If with the new ordinance, whatever that house, whatever that zoning may be, is there a possibility that God forbid, if we were to have a hurricane on tomorrow and those mobile home trailers were destroyed and they're not in a classified mobile home area, then would those individuals be displaced because they could not then replace their mobile homes with another mobile homes because of the impetus with the UDO that may be coming in legislation? The answer there is, uh, let me give you a series of answers. Yes, 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 and no. Now let me explain to you the answers, okay? okay? First of all, we'd be very happy to have another public meeting. That's not a problem. Staff is here to serve. We'll be happy to do that. The second thing is, Wherever there is a non-conforming use, and in many cases mobile homes are non-conforming uses, that exists today. Not the new UDO once you adopt it. Mm -hmm. The UDO may make some things non-conforming the way of mobile homes, but if you have a non-conforming use and a tornado blows it down, a fire unfortunately happens, 
uh, whatever may happen, then that, that use cannot be replaced. That already exists in the zoning law. So there are places in town where we have non-conforming mobile homes. And I'll give you an example. In the downtown area that is currently zoned, what's the current zoning? RD5 or RD3, which is going to become what category? DTR, downtown residential. Those, neither of those districts, none of those districts currently allow mobile home. Mm -hmm. But we do have some. Right. If something happened in that mobile home, then it could not be replaced. But that's with a not, mobile home. With a, with a mobile mm -hmm. home. You could replace it with a conforming use. So, you know, we will be very happy. The other thing that I would encourage everybody to do, at the City Council's direction, we set up a website. Ryan will come up and tell you how to access that again because I'm not a computer person. But what it allows you to do is to put in your address. So if you live at 1313 Mockingbird Lane, which is the home of Herman Munster, by the way, <laughs> if you live there with Herman Munster, you can pull up 1313 Mockingbird Lane and it will show you your current zoning and the uses that are in it mm -hmm. and the proposed zoning and uses that are in there. So we would, we would encourage everyone to go to the website and look up your individual address. But if you're in a mobile home, I will say to you, don't be surprised if you that's find you're already non-conforming. Yeah, that's already the same. So. Oh, yeah. Any further discussion? We have a motion and a second. Here. Mayor. I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Washington and Dr. Woodruff will need, both have indicated they will not be here for the April 8th meeting. Well, then we'll push it off for four if you, weeks. If that would be acceptable. The 22nd, I believe, would be okay. the next meeting. Is that uh, in your motion? Is that good? Fine. Okay. Everybody's good. Second? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Are we, are we able to vote on this now? Okay. All right. All those in favor of the motion here to defer this until the April 22nd meeting and uh, staff supplies with additional information. Was the, All other, was the other motion withdrawn? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Properly. Correct. Yes, okay. Withdrawn. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Thank you, Council. That brings us to our first session of public comment for the evening, and I have this is be our first and only session of public comment for the evening. I have Mr. Jeff Bender that has signed up to speak. Hey, Jeff, come on up. We'll let everything settle down and you can start. How's everything going? It's a pleasure meeting you too. Thank you very much for helping us out tonight. I, I do thank you. I, you did an outstanding job, young man. Yes, you did. Good to see you again. Take care. Yes, sir. Good night. Thank you for coming. Um, Some people go ahead. You know, I guess when we had the discussion on corridor commercial, I guess we decided. You know, I don't know what happened. Who knows? Well, it was changed. Somebody, I don't think anybody's going to get fined for this, do they? I know, but that's, do you? that's today. I, know. I mean, there may be a need one of these days. Oh, it yeah. Oh, it will. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, good valid points on both sides of the issue. Yes, there was. All right. Uh, well. Dr. Woodruff is still out in the vestibule. Mm -hmm. 
are, I'm, I'm hoping you're here to announce some uh, discount days there. At, sell, uh, on hot, sell on hot Jeff dogs Jeff's. and Paul Parker's. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Brown, take care. Okay. Good seeing you too. All right, we'll go ahead and uh, start back up here. And Jeff, you, you just give your name and address to the clerk. That'd be My great. name is Jeff Bender. My address is 2550 Onslow Drive. Um, I was currently uh, just wanting the council to consider changing on the LED message boards uh, regulations in town. Um, currently, the city's LED signs are regulated uh, not to have any animation or blinking lights and uh, not to change for 29 seconds. Um, the NCDOT has the billboards and uh, they're able to change every eight seconds. Uh, the large billboards like you see when you drive to Swansboro um, can be seen 1,500 feet out. Traveling at 60 miles an hour converts to 88 feet per second, uh, which means they have basically a 17 second, uh, 17 seconds of view before they pass the billboard. Um, when you look at that, uh, <clears throat> in Jacksonville, our speed limits range from 35 to 45 miles an hour, which converts over to about 51 to 66 feet per second. Um, the signs we have in Jacksonville can be seen on average 500 feet away uh, from the sign. If a vehicle is going 45 miles an hour, then they have eight seconds of view time. Um, and at 35 miles per hour, they have nine seconds of view time. <clears throat> so to be in comparison with the NCDOT, the, the city should allow the LED signs to change roughly every five seconds. Um, most drivers will only see the sign change one time before they pass it. Uh, this allows us to use larger text or larger photos or clip art <clears throat> in order to get the, the message across faster to allow the drivers to read the signs faster, allowing them to keep their eyes on the road. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not here to ask for any changes to the animation or the blinking. Um, I feel those are distractions, especially at nighttime. Um, I feel this modification uh, <clears throat> in time will allow businesses to focus on making sure we keep our messages short with easy, large, easy to read text or pictures and allow businesses to choose the time that is sufficient to read the information on the sign. I have tried to pull, <clears throat> put all my information on one screen so it would not need to change <clears throat> and it cut down the distance it could be read from f f to about a, a 300 feet out. It cut it down by about 150 to 200 feet um, and it doubled the amount that the driver's trying to read in the amount of time that they're passing. Um, I think for safety reasons the time should be changed to five seconds or greater you know, allowing the business owners to decide the amount of time it takes to read the information that they are putting on the screen. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank, thank you. Um, thanks a lot. Can you uh, look into his concerns about that? I, I'm, yes, I'm not sure what the. Uh, yes, yeah, we'll, we'll be happy to. Uh, the one thing that we did not say when the public was here, and, and so I'll just take a moment to say it right now. Any ordinance as complex, even though in theory we've made it simplified. In reality, I'm not so sure government ever simplifies anything, but there will always be the need to look at issues that come up. You should not be surprised if over the next six months we don't have every other council meeting a revision because it's everybody's best effort. Now, this particular matter, we'll be happy to meet with him and further discuss it and give you additional information. I would very quickly point out, though, that studies are there that show at different speeds the importance of signs not changing or changing. So we will be happy to get you uh, digital information on that. Right. Thank you. I thought it was my understanding that we were going to look at that as part of the comprehensive sign package. That's correct. Okay. So, I mean, that's uh, something, you know, that's going to come up that you could probably have some input into, you know. So. Since they uh, they put mine up last week, and I've already had four different customers complain that I didn't it didn't change fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate you coming out tonight, no Jeff. Problem. Okay. Uh I think that's all we got tonight other than we got some reports and I think I will stop start with Mr. Warden. He looks very pensive down there. He must have plenty to talk about. No, 
I don't, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Uh, no report. No report. Mr. Bender? No report this evening. No report, Tim Lazar. Very quickly, TDA, Tourism Development Authority, this past weekend we had nearly 800 runners that participated in the annual Engineers Challenge run at Courthouse Bay. Mm -hmm. In the past, this had uh, about one-third the number of runners, uh, our outreach, which produced many heads on beds, and we're still continuing to get reports, uh, demonstrated the power of promoting many of the things that we currently already have that we've been involved with that we're helping the promotion of. Uh, we are accepting applications for the FY15 Tourism Development Fund projects, um, and they're being completed now. If you know of an event that could benefit Heads on Beds for Jacksonville Lodging Facilities and did not get an application, call Carmela George or visit the city's website. Uh, in preparation for a long-range capital budget discussion, the Tourism Development Authority will meet in an extended session April 17th. During that time, we will hear from those who work the development of tourism every day about their view of the future. The authority will hear these reports and then consider awards for the Tourism Promotion Fund. Um, the session is set for 11 a.m. Thursday, April 17th in meetings room A and B, and it is open to the public. Also, um, from our uh, MPO, uh, the current federal transportation uh, legislation known as MAP 21 will expire on October 1st, 2014. Uh, this legislation has provided maintenance operation construction funding for all transportation systems within the U.S. Uh, the President's budget increases funding for transportation by approximately 300 million, uh, 300 billion, I'm sorry, uh, over a four-year period. However, it's unclear if the proposal will uh, survive the legislative process. Uh, these, uh, there appears to be broad support in Congress for additional spending on transportation infrastructure, but no consensus where the revenue will come from. So we continue to work on those efforts. The MPO staff submitted our transportation project list to the NCDOT earlier this month, and we expect to have preliminary project scores by the end of March. Once these scores are available, the MPO will solicit feedback from the council and the public before making a recommendation to the TAC on the prioritization of those projects based on the scoring and input. Um, and that is the end of my report. Thank you very much. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem Lazar. Uh, the only thing I have tonight is I just want to uh, ask everyone that's watching the regular meeting tonight to get a chance to catch the uh, workshop that we had earlier, uh, especially the pre-budget information that was put out by Dr. Woodruff. And uh, just to let you know, right now where we're at as far as the financial situation the city faces in uh, in the coming year. And Dr. Woodruff, any input? Two quick things. Uh, first of all, the mayor and council have uh, been very concerned about stacking problems on 17 at the intersection of 17 and Western. At your direction, we have been working with the uh, MPO staff, Anthony Prince here in the city, and also with the DOT officials. Uh, the DOT is currently contemplating and we believe will approve uh, extending those stacking lanes substantially beyond so that many more people can stack. We're continuing to look at the timing at that intersection. We hope that within the next several days we're going to be able, probably the next week, not the next several days, make additional timing changes. But we do want the public to know we're aware of that problem. We're trying to find some solutions. We believe the DOT is going to be uh, favorable to amend the current construction contract that will allow us to extend those turn lanes substantially beyond where they currently are. So we'd ask the public to have patience. The mayor and council and staff are looking at this. We appreciate the assistance of Representative Shepard in Cleveland, Senator Brown, as we've worked on this matter. As always, Mayor, we thank you and the council for your service, your dedication, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wood Woodruff. Uh, Mr. Carter? No report. Thank you. Okay. With that, uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So be it. All in favor? All in favor? I take it as aye. <laughs>